we saw that uh, the annual wages of workers exhibit uh, significant rigidities, uh, both in nominal terms and in real terms. Um, So these rigidities we saw were uh, in nominal terms, in that there is a big mass of workers who have uh, nominal wage freezes from year to year. And we also saw that then there was also a big mass of workers that for uh, whom wages increased, nominal wages increased by just the amount of uh, inflation. So these are uh, workers for whom uh, real wage were frozen. So this, uh, this is something that we saw. Now, the issue is that in uh, the matching model that we are, we are working with, um, what matters to firm is um, the wage that, you know, the key decision that the firm does is whether they hire a worker or not. And what matters to them at the time of making that decision is the wage that they can expect to pay the worker during the entire duration of the relationship. Because, you know, you hire somebody, you know that you'll have to keep them for many years. And you, as a firm, you kind of have an idea of how productive they will be. Uh, and you also need to have an idea of how much they will cost you. And then you compare, you know, cost and benefits and you decide whether to hire the person or not. Um, so, so in a way, the fact that once you've hired that person, their wages are going to be fixed over time is, uh, you know, well, let's say, you know, is are going to be very rigid over time is not sufficient, uh, is not sufficient information when we build our model, because what we need to know is whether the amount of wages that will be paid during the entire relationship is rigid or not, because that's what affects the decision of the firm to, you know, post like post vacancies and higher workers or not post vacancies and not higher workers. Um, so, and, and this is a point that's very well known in, in the literature um, and, you know, maybe was most famously articulated uh, in a Pissarides 2009 um, paper in Econometrica. Uh, so the point is information on wages in existing relationship is not really sufficient to, to really document the type of wage rigidity that matters in the model. The type of wage rigidity that matters in the model is the rigidity of the entire wage that's paid during the entire relationship. So it's not true that the wage of existing workers is irrelevant, it's, but it's only one piece of the puzzle. What you need to know is not only that wages are going to be rigid in existing relationship, you also need to know what happens to the wages of new hires. And then once you combine wages of new hires, so basically the wages that's attached to vacancy, and then information on how wages evolve in existing relationship, once you combine these two things, then you have the full picture of the wage in the entire relationship, and then you can, you know, and then you can build a model around that. You can use that evidence when you build your model. Um, and so, of course, so we've seen that in existing relationships, uh, there are significant rigidities. Uh, so because of course, most workers remain in the same job. So when you just look at annual earnings of workers, this is really mostly evidence on um, in existing jobs. This is mostly uh, that type of evidence. Now, if you want to know what happens to wages of new hires, you've got to look at wages that are attached to uh, vacancies that are posted, um, because this is going to tell you when a new worker comes into a firm, what's going to happen. And it turns out that there's a paper that uh, does exactly that. It's a very nice paper uh, by uh, Hazel and co -authors. It's uh, still a working paper. In this paper, they use data from Burning Glass, um, which is a company that collects uh, vacancies from many online job portals to look at how the wage associated with each vacancies uh, varies over time. And so what's, what's very nice here is that uh, they are able to look at a vacancy for a given job in a given firm, in a given location. And then you can see over time 
how the wedge associated with that specific job varies, which is exactly the type of information that we need you know, to complement the information we have on uh, wedges in existing relationship to be able to get a complete understanding on how the wedge over the entire relationship is going to vary over time. Um, so in, the, in this paper, um, what do they find? Well, they do find that there are also significant rigidities in uh, wedges that are posted with vacancies. So they find significant rigidities in posted wedges. Uh, which is, you know, not all that surprising because we know uh, from the work of Bewley. So in Bewley's book, uh, Bewley documents that you know firms are very reluctant to cut wages because that damages morale. So that explains why um, wages are fairly stable in existing relationship. But Bewley also documents that there are a lot of internal equity constraints. So firms cannot pay workers who do the same job very different wages. So if wages are, you know rigid for all the workers in a given job. When you hire a new guy, it's not true that you can pay them much more and pay them much less because internal equity dictates that they have to be paid roughly the same. Um, so in a sense, this is not very surprising, but it's very nice to have um, proper empirical evidence of what uh, Julie documented in his ethnographic survey. So uh, in the Hazel paper, um, so here I'm showing you table three. Um, which is uh, very nice. It basically redoes the type of analysis that uh, Nakamura and Steinson did uh, for prices using uh, CPI uh, microdata, but here it does it for the wages that are associated with vacancies. Um, and so what they what uh, they show here is looking at nominal posted wage uh, change. Uh, so at the job level, so this is really for one job within one firm in one uh, in one um, location. And so first thing you can see is that uh, first they give a frequency of a wedge change. And you can see that uh, or the probability of a wedge change, so the frequency of a wedge change is around uh, 0 0.14. And here I should say, so this is um, this is a probability um, per quarter. So it's, uh, of course, it's key to have the uh, so time uh, units here because uh, otherwise you, you uh, cannot know exactly. Whereas you know, for prices, you remember that this probability of price changes were reported per month. So, you know, uh, but of course, prices change more often than wages. So this is per quarter. And you can see that the average uh, oh, yes, I should have uh, said it's quarterly, yes. This is per quarter. So the, uh, the probability of changes a wedge uh, on a vacancy per quarter is 0 0.14. And so then you can infer the uh, expected duration uh, for which the wedge remains at the same level, and that's 1 over uh, the frequency. Um, so the duration of unchanged wedge is 1 over the probability change. Um, and so here you can see, so if you invert that, you get a, a duration of unchanged range of around uh, six quarters, which is uh, 1.5 years. Uh, so duration of unchanged range again is in quarters. And so this is uh, 1.5 years, which, you know, is kind of in line with what we saw. Uh, we saw earlier that many workers do not get a change in nominal wage from year to year. So this is fairly, you know, fairly similar type of evidence. Um, but so, so here you see you can expect a vacancy uh, to advertise the same wage for 1.5 years. So this is quite significant. Then you have a few. Uh, oops, sorry. Um, then they look at, uh, uh, you know, they, they wait a little bit vacancies differently, but you always get roughly the same. Uh, you know, roughly 1.5 years uh, is a duration through which the vacancy keeps uh, the same uh, wage. Then what's very nice is that um, they also look at whether wedge, 
wages go up or wages go down when the wages do change. So that's uh, very interesting. And what you can see, so first you can see that uh, so wages are going to change 14% of the time and 3% of the time is going to be a wage decrease actually. So again, we can see that strict downward nominal wage rigidity is not a thing. Sometimes the wage associated uh, with a specific job is going to fall. Um, but of course, the wedge is more likely to increase. So the rest of the time, 11% of the time, you'll have a probability increase. So this means roughly that, uh, what you can see is that roughly 20% of the wedges, wedge changes are decreases and 80% um, are uh, increases. No, it's, but it's not that surprising that you have more increases because you have many forces that push for wage increase. Um, technological progress, inflation uh, are such things. Uh, such things. Um, so this is uh, this is what they find, um, and so we do see that wages for vacancies actually are also quite stable over time. They tend to rise. Uh, more than decrease, but you do have some uh, you do have some decreases. So then the paper gives a bit more detail on the distribution of wage changes. Uh, so let's look at this. So here it is. So uh, here we have the distribution of uh, the changes in wages for the posted wage. This is only when. So here they've eliminated. Uh, this is only for the non-zero wedge growth, so it means they've eliminated the mass, uh, the mass of vacancies for which wages do not change from quarter to quarter. Um, and so you can see that um, you do have uh, wage decreases here in nominal term. Um, of course, there are more wage increases on the other side, and you can see here. that a lot of uh, the nominal wage change seems to be around, you know, maybe 3% here, which is roughly the level of inflation um, during that time. Uh, so here again, you have a big evidence of uh, real wage rigidity. So Right, we see that when the wage changes, it changes by roughly 3%. What we also know is wage change occur on average every six quarters, um, because firms are constantly posting vacancies for similar jobs. Um, so we know that these wage changes, they occur every six quarters. So 3% uh, on average, this is for six quarters. So that's 2%. Yeah, so it means that rough, so roughly when there is a change, the pace at which the nominal wage changes is roughly 2% per year. Uh, and so because inflation because inflation is roughly 2% per year in the US, uh, this means that the wage associated with vacancy says the same. And then when they, when they do change, they ro roughly catch up for inflation. So, this, so it means that the, so that the real wage uh, remains the same. So this is again evidence of real wage rigidity, quite strong evidence actually, because you see there is really a big peak around that level. Um, and then another uh, piece of interesting information for the paper is um, the it is um, a comparison of their evidence, so which is the duration of unchanged wages for uh, vacancies, so for new workers, with evidence from other papers on the duration of unchanged wages in existing relationship. And what you see, what's very interesting is uh, what we have here, is that, um, so what they find is that Wages, nominal wages remain the same for roughly a year and a half. And but this is for posted wages. And recent papers that, uh, as I say, use this survey without measurement errors, they find exactly the same, that uh, wages in existing relationship also stay the same for roughly 1.5 years. Um, so it looks like there is really no, no, what we learn from this is that there is no significant 
difference in rigidity um, between new and existing uh, workers. And again, this is not uh, all that surprising. This just points to very strong internal equity concerns, which were already highlighted by Bewley in the 90s. So you have strong internal equity uh, constraints. that Julie mentioned in his uh, book. And so if you have this strong internal equity constraint, then you know, new hires and existing hires would be treated in fairly similar manner. And so this is really a nice confirmation of that, that uh, wages tend to change for roughly the same amount, whether you look at continuing workers or uh, new workers. <clears throat> 